Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Christine McCleave. I'm the executive director for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. Um, I believe many of you have probably joined us for other webinars that we've had in this uh, series. Today is the last webinar in our two-part series that's been running for the entirety of the year. So this is episode 10, Truth and Healing Initiatives. And uh, before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of um, housekeeping that we usually do at the top of the webinar in case any of you are new, if this is your first webinar or um, with, with us or your first webinar using WebEx. So you'll notice that on the um, right hand side of your computer screen, you have some controls. You are all joined in listen only mode. So um, you don't have to worry about muting your phone. And um, there is a section um, under those controls that says questions. So we will do a Q&A at the end of um, the presentation. And if you have questions, go ahead and ask those as our presenter is speaking. You can just um, type your question and make sure to reference um, what she said that is prompting your question, just um, to remind us as we go back and read those at the end. And um, we're also going to issue a quick uh, poll, and we do this every time. So um, the first one is uh, launching now. So if you could go ahead and respond to that, we're asking you if you are a boarding school survivor or a descendant or neither. So we'll give people a, a minute to go ahead and and respond. Uh, we have 80% uh, response rate so far, and now it's 84. So if you go ahead and respond, click one of those. Um, we're almost up to 100%. It says that we've got um, about half of you are um, either a boarding school survivor or descendant and half of you are neither. So um, we're gonna go ahead and close that even though we didn't get 100% response rate. I don't know if perhaps somebody logged in and then is not at their desk. So um, the next poll we're gonna launch is what sector are you joining us from? And we're limited to five responses through this um, through this poll setup. So um, there is another box if, if one of those does not apply for you. All right, so we've got, um, looks like about 25% of you from tribal services or urban Indian services, 9% from social work or child welfare, 30% from academia or higher education, 13% K through 12 um, or early childhood education, and 25% other. So if you answered other, if you could just go ahead and um, use the question box to tell us which um, sector you're from that's other that we that we missed on that. So I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. Uh, looks like we just got you know, two more people responded and I think we're good. Okay, so closing that poll. Thank you so much for responding. It's important for us to know who our audience is and um, for our speaker today to, to have that little bit of background. You know, uh, we've noticed as we've done this whole series that those numbers have stayed pretty consistent, um, that our audience is, is pretty half and half as far as boarding school survivors, descendants, and then not being boarding school survivor or descendants. And so, oh, hey, there's Liz. Hi. Um, we can all hear you. You're not muted right now, just so you know. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so also pretty eclectic mix as far as what sector people are joining us from. So um, that's good to know. It's it's also really um, really encouraging to know that we're reaching people in a multiple. Um, varieties of, of uh, workspaces and, and the work that you're doing in your communities um, and in your, your professional lives. So, in personal lives, we know, um, I know from experience that some of you are joining, um, you know, not because it's related to your work, but because it's a personal um, interest and issue in, in your lives. So, 
Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm not going to give the spiel about our organization, but if you are not as familiar with us um, and you want to know more about the Boarding School Healing Coalition, visit us at boardingschoolhealing.org. And um, now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Liz Medicine Crow is the president and CEO of First Alaskans Institute up in Anchorage, Alaska. She's going to talk to us today about truth and healing initiatives. So I will go ahead and hand things over to you, Liz. Oh, fantastic. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can see and hear me okay. Um, I want to make sure to introduce myself correctly. Um, this is my grandmother, Mona Jackson. Kanahek is my grandfather, Tommy Jackson Sr. Stathkawas Hinudi Aukiang. Stathkawas is my mother, Della Chini. Bilchini Hinudi Kadkiang. Bilchini is my father. Uh, he makes his home in our community of cake. Uh, Lagunai, uh, Hinudi Khadkil Dikyang. Lagunai is my uh, Khadkil name, my Haida name. And Gatsakas um, Gustu Dikwalagin, I am Eagle, Chichkitne Uda Ijong, and I'm a Chichkitne woman. Our crest is the hummingbird. Uh, that's my, uh, who I am as a as a uh, Haida woman. Katsas Yukhat Duasalk, Katsas is my Tlingit name. Uh, uh, I am Raven, that's my clan. Uh, and that is that is who I am. I'm a Kachari woman. Our freshwater mark Sakai is our clan crest. And I come from Kihuan, uh, the village that never sleeps. Um, Kihuan is in southeast Alaska. And on my little hand map of Alaska, I'm from about right there. And um, it's a, a Tlingit community. My uh, my Haida family is from Masset, British Columbia, uh, from Haida Gwaii, and um, and Heidelberg, Alaska. And it's a real honor to be here with all of you today to share some of our work that we're doing here at First Alaskans Institute. The episode is about truth and healing initiatives. And one of the things that I just, I really want to say is that I've had an opportunity to do a little bit of work with the National Native American um, Boarding School Healing Coalition and with Christine. And I'm so grateful about the work that they have been doing, but also the work that they have in front of them. Um, it takes a lot of courage and stamina and love to do the work of creating a space for truth and for healing, to be able to know that creating those spaces will be transformative for our people as Native people. And we know that because we've been told this by our family, our friends, our communities. There's been a deep uh, longing and a call for initiatives to really raise up the level of consciousness and awareness about the truth that, of what has happened to our people and where we are at. At First Alaskans Institute, our vision is progress for the next 10,000 years. It's hard for people to really understand what that means, but as Native people, it's not as difficult for us because that's at a minimum what has already gone before us. And so our responsibility as a living generations now is to continue to add, to make space for, and to call and invite, um, to be in service of, uh, to stand beside, and to find ways forward 
for the brilliance and innovation of our native peoples. And the world needs us. It needs our native people. It needs the wisdom and the guidance and the love and the tough love, the real love, um, the heart love of our communities. And, you know, we have a lot of buzzwords around these days, like sustainability and resilience. And who better than to really um, show us an example uh, and to connect to what those things really mean than Native people. Um, in Alaska and in the United States, there has been many efforts to eradicate us. Uh, that's just the truth. And um, we're still here. We're not going anywhere. And our children are growing up at a time when these truth and healing initiatives are becoming not just the topic of conversation, but become a becoming a normal way for us to address the intergenerational harms that have been done to us, the things that have been purposeful in policy and action in decision-making, as well as the consequence, kind of consequences of those decisions. There's a, um, a quote that I've been really thinking about lately and I've been thinking about it in terms of our Native community. And um, it's by an East Indian philosopher. And he says, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And when I first heard that, it really kind of, it kind of, took a grip with me because it articulated something that we've been saying, our, our people have been saying for a long time. Um, when goals such as assimilation um, are the target way for people to feel like they're part of something and part of this country, part of Alaska, um, it, it eats away and tears away at who we are as Indigenous people, uh, in our fullness, our wholeness. And this quote resonated with me because I started thinking about it in, that, in another way, which is essentially, if we look at all these statistics people have been saying about our Native people, these numbers that people track, there's huge disproportionalities, right? We all know this. So I'm thinking about this quote and I'm thinking about that, that quote unquote fact. And I think, okay, well, what our people are telling us is that we are not well adjusted. We are not well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And because our people continue to be who we are despite everything that's happened to us, that we are not just alive, but we are here strongly, firmly standing on our homelands and moving forward, knowing who we are and making sure that our children know who they are. Is it perfect? No, we're not perfect, no one is but we are working in that direction. And we are listening to one another and we are trying to effectuate those dreams of our ancestors and our elders by creating these different spaces and forums, these truth and healing initiatives um, to try to give life and make space for our people and for other people who've experienced these things, other people of color as well and those intersections of identity that um, are harmed because 
we are living in a society who places value on some people over others. And that is something that we at First Alaskans Institute and so many other places like um, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition are, uh, are working to transform. So all of that is an introduction to the, the, the love and the commitment and the passion to what has come about here uh, First Alaskans Institute to be involved with, and it's called the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Endeavor. And it's TRHT for short, of course, because we love our acronyms. <laughs> but um, one of the things that I want to say at the very front end of describing what TRHT is about is that we don't call it truth and reconciliation. Uh, because to reconcile means that we would have had to have started from a place of good relationships to reconcile back to good relationships. And that's just not the history of, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Angela. <laughs> she saw me struggling with my runny nose. Sorry, everyone. Um, But reconciling back to a history of good relationships is just not the truth. And that's not the truth in this country and it's not the truth in Alaska. And our people have been asking for something like uh, a truth and reconciliation movement, but we didn't want to start off with a false narrative. And that false narrative for us would be to call it reconciliation. Um, and so instead of focusing on a false narrative, um, we're engaged in truth, racial healing and transformation because that is the goal. That is the vision. That's what we're working towards. And we wanted to put something out there that we're aiming towards. And this effort for truth, racial healing and transformation is about creating a space for the truth to be told. And it's about healing these generational harms. And it is about righting wrongs and taking note so that we can make sure that in the future, these things are not forgotten or glibly swept under the rug, but that we can create the record for our future generations to know and to understand where we have come from and the things that we have endured and survived. Because at the end of the day, in you know a couple hundred years in the future, our dream is that our young people will only know about this because of the history that we have preserved and not because of the lives that they have to live. And that's what we mean by transformation, that we're gonna replace this um, societal principle that some people matter more than others and replace it with a human-centered society like we have had for thousands of years here and there are a couple kind of framing components of the truth, racial healing and transformation endeavor. And there are 14 other places across the country who are also engaged um, in TRHT activities. Um, but there is not a prescription for what that looks like because each place is different, each community um, who's leading it and um, enacting it on behalf of their, their communities is different. So here in Alaska, uh, we are focused on creating um, truth-telling forums. We call them tribunals uh, so that we can 
convey the message of the importance of creating those spaces, but that doesn't really feel like the right word for us. And so we're taking some guidance um, and some wisdom from our people uh, about different ways of thinking about that. And in these truth-telling forums, we'll have the opportunity to capture the uh, testimony of those who come before us, um, before the people who are going to be there to receive their stories. And we'll have some research that supports the work of the forum that we're creating. Um, so that there's some context to some of those stories, and then those things can be shared out with the community at large, could be built into curriculum in schools, um, could be used by organizations um, to understand uh, where things are at and where they're going, and um, to really kind of set that record. They'll also be utilized to allow us to um, be solution focused um, so that we can, as people engaged in this work and those who come before the, the tribunal space, be actively involved in creating solutions that they think will, will work for them and for their communities. And um, part of those spaces will be um, a heavy emphasis on uh, providing and connecting people who come and participate with resources, um, with healers, with uh, counselors, um, with um, various methods of supporting people so that we're not just opening um, a space for people to share their wounds, but we're opening a place where people can heal or, or continue healing and um, that they have access to a number of different kinds of people who are there to support them and support their families and support their communities. And um, First Alaskans, as an organization, we've committed to hosting six of these types of forums statewide. So we're going to be um, setting our schedule um, in the new year for what that looks like in the in the in that year and then the coming year um, to host these. And um, we're also uh, growing an endowment. Um, and we're, we're both fundraising for it and trying to find partners to help us build that endowment so that the work will continue at the pace of the communities who want to engage in a TRHT type of forum space for their community specifically. Um, so we're gonna host six statewide and then also um, work with and partner with communities who want to address um, specific histories and issues and legacies within their community at the pace of the community. So it's really meant to be a scalable process that allows them to bring their truths forward where they're comfortable bringing it forward and um, where, they're, where they're wanting to make sure that these things are captured um, for, for historical purposes, but also for healing um, to be kind of centered and moving with their community at their community's pace. So there's two different aspects to the way that we're setting up our TRHT. And um, I think one of the most important parts is around this notion of what racial healing means. So there's five pillars to the way that we're doing this work and same with the other um, 14 places around the country, and that is racial healing, uh, narrative change, which you've already heard me talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit about um, separation, law, and economy, um, because those things really are the the ways in which our people um, have been impacted by the society um, that moved in. Um, 
on top of us here in this country and, and our state. And um, the racial healing aspect is really hard for people to understand. I think people think it's touchy feely when you say the word healing. Um, but as native people, we know that it's actually some of the hardest work um, that we can do. Uh, and it's the work that our people need and have been asking for. Um, they want the truth to be known. And that's absolutely necessary for justice um, because we can't have healing without justice. And we have to be able to create those spaces where our people can share their stories and experiences, their personal ones, of their families, of their cultures, of their communities, to, to speak on behalf of our lands, our waters, our animals, um, that we have these really deep and spiritual relationships with. These things are really necessary for us uh, to be able to um, mark a moment in time and come alongside one another. So the racial healing aspect is about understanding the consequences of what the society's um, systems have created and allow for people to have the space, um, uh, the opportunity to really start or continue because we're all on this healing journey and everyone's at different places um, to continue to deepen that work. And what we think about in terms of um, the three pillars of separation, law, and economy is around how those things um, must be transformed in order for us to leave um, this hierarchy of human value um, that has been created and move to or move back to, for Native people, a human-centered society. And when we talk about separation, and I think this is really true in this, um, in this webinar with the National Native American uh, Boarding School Healing Coalition, is when we talk about separation, we're talking about the things that we have had um, taken from us, right? So we've had um, our lands taken from us. Um, we've been separated from our languages and our cultures. Uh, our children were taken from us uh, through boarding schools, whether they were um, state or government based or um, missionary or Christian based. Our children were taken from us and today they still are being taken from us and Alaska, our child welfare system, though our children make up 15% of the state population, our children are 60% of the uh, custody of um, placement in foster care. So our children are still in that situation. And um, we can go through a number of different things, the ability to live our ways of life and to be in a good relationship with our lands, our waters and our animals so that we can understand how to and how much to um, uh, harvest, to gather, to fish, to hunt. Um, those things have been separated from, our, from us. Um, so when we think about what that component looks like, those are the kinds of things that we're thinking about as Indigenous people. You know, when we think about the other people, because this is a statewide initiative and it is about Indigenous people, our, our specific political status, as well as our racial status. And in that racial status, we also share uh, the relationship with our other people of color in those intersections of identity. And, um, and in those areas of separation, you know, the, the, the one that we all know about is that, that stolen life of, of slavery in this country, of um, stolen labor through the stealing of those lives. And, um, and so 
there's opportunity through this process here in Alaska to also create space for our brothers and sisters who come from different racial groups. And um, when we think about law and uh, economy, we know here in Alaska that um, the all of the um, resources that fund the state government here are taken from rural Alaska, from our, our, our native lands. And those um, resources and the people in our villages across the state are subsidizing um, everyone who lives here. Um, although that truth is not shared, that truth is not understood um, and people actually think that the opposite is occurring, that somehow our, our, our villages and our, our communities and our native people are somehow being subsidized by the state. And it's actually the exact opposite of that. And so we need to create these forums where we can have those kinds of truths be told. And in the telling of the truth, to build from a place of strength, the solutions <clears throat> that we can enact together um, to really effectuate a completely different way of being with one another. And that's the transformation we're talking about. In the creation of these tribunal spaces that First Alaskans will be hosting, uh, we are looking for and inviting and reaching out to different agencies and organizations, churches, groups of people who are willing and able and ready to be accountability partners, um, responsibility partners, uh, those people who can say, you know what, I'm here now. I may not have been here 100 years ago. I may not have been here 50 years ago, um, but I can recognize that there was a legacy that predates me. And I want to take the time to stand alongside and be in solidarity with our Native people and other people of color. And I want to reflect back on the legacy of my agency, of my organization, of my church, of my social group, um, and say, that's, that's where we were. And, and we also care enough to want to be part of the transformative effort so that we can get together and move forward for what the future will be like here in Alaska. And so these accountability partners are really important because they'll be also present during these tribunal spaces and they'll have the opportunity to listen to these truths being told, these testimonies, and they'll have an opportunity to also reflect back and look into their own entities to reflect on what their legacy has been and to participate in those solution-based conversations and those healing opportunities to think forward about how they are going to transform that legacy and how they can enact that transformation in their day-to-day -day operations, in their agencies, in their communities, in their families, in their organizations. And so they'll be brought along with and part of the endeavor and part of the family focused on healing and enacting um, and, and carrying out the connecting between that heart space of healing and the truth telling to um, the legacy of their organizations and um, and the uh, the policy, the law and policy um, opportunities there are to actually operationalize those solutions to help transform the state, their community, their organization. Um, so it's really um, it's not about blaming or shaming or guilt. Um, it is actually about healing those things. And it's not a one time, oh, now that it's been done, we can move on. Um, that is not what this is about. And um, we really wanna make sure that people understand that this is about changing to that, that degree of understanding. Because when we do that, we actually can transform those outcomes in really 
in really important and critical ways. And, you know, the world needs us as Native people. And we need us as Native people. And so this is an opportunity to allow for those truths to be told, for those rights to happen, for those wrongs to be righted, for those issues to be addressed, and for the people involved to be able to add their knowledge, their wisdom, their experience into the solutions that we can actually then um, implement, right? We can implement on a personal basis within our families and our communities, and most importantly, into the structures and the society and the governments um, who, who claim to be representing us. And this is a way for us to actually give them the opportunity to really live into that um, and to really lift that up. And um, there are so many people who are ready for this, who, who want this, um, not just in our community, but in multiple communities and in a lot of different organizations and agencies. Um, I think that we're at a, a, a tipping point um, as, um, as Alaskans and as people in this country, I think that we're at a space and a time where the living generations understand that we have to address this stuff because not addressing it has not worked. And um, if we continue down this path, uh, there will be no change in those massive disproportionalities. And in fact, those things might actually and are actually getting worse. So in order to make sure that we're taking care of the spirit of our ancestors, uplifting our elders and our survivors and our descendants um, and preparing a pathway for our future, this is something that our community here in Alaska has brought up for decades. Um, and really that wisdom is something that we've been trying to tap into and trying to really kind of lift up and be the legs that carry that effort forward along with so many others, so many other partners. Um, one of our, our biggest partners um, uh, who has added their funds um, to our own is the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And they're the ones that have also funded um, a variety of TRHT efforts in these different 14 places. And they all are completely different. And they are responsive to and reflective of their community. So they're very community driven. Um, so we're really looking forward to hosting these. Um, and we've been learning a lot um, from all kinds of different people. We have a, uh, an amazing visionary group of people who've been part of our Alaska Native Dialogues on Racial Equity, um, and also um, our TRHT uh, visionary group who's come together to continue to give us advice and guidance and input into how we develop the process. We've hosted numerous dialogues and discussions around the state to get input um, from our community um, as a whole. Uh, so all kinds of different people participating. But the one group that we have um, so much gratitude for is our healers, our native healers. Um, some people call them traditional healers. Um, we just call them healers. They're just our native people who have these gifts and these skills in service to taking care of us and tending to us. And um, We've hosted them in a couple of different ways and in a couple of different places to get their advice, their counsel, um, their advice uh, around how do we create a space for healing? Because we don't wanna harm our people. We don't wanna harm others. Uh, we wanna create a space that allows for those truths to be told um, in a way that uplifts people so that we move from, um, intergenerational trauma uh, to intergenerational healing and that we move from post-traumatic stress to post-traumatic growth and that we are doing that with their understanding of the human component um, and that we're assisted by the ceremonies of our ancestors and how we do that 
um, and we're a really diverse group of Alaska Native peoples um, because that's just the umbrella term, but it actually doesn't address the completely distinct societies of, of Native peoples and nations that exist here in Alaska. Um, there's a, about 11 or 12, depending on how people talk about it, completely distinct nations of Native people, as distinct from one another as we would be from a tribe down south or a nation down south or our Hawaiian brothers and sisters. Um, and that's how different we are here in the state. Um, and so this umbrella term is essentially just the indigenous peoples of Alaska, but as indigenous peoples, we're really different from one another in really beautiful and profound and amazing ways because we were created by our lands and our languages are the languages of our lands, of our waters, of our animals and the, the way that we communicate. So across our very diverse geography, we have this amazingly intense level of diversity and that's a huge strength and we want to make sure that we're taking care of that and that we're, we're, we're holding and honoring the space of that di diversity, that fire of our people and contributing to uplift um, and be a part of the healing process for our people. Because of course this predates us and it will post-date us as well. And so as the living generations now, we're just thinking about in the time that we have, can we make sure that we are contributing to the well-being and the healing of our people? That's what this endeavor is really about. So I, I think that kind of concludes my, my comments and my kind of description about what we're trying to do here in Alaska and just opening it up for um, for the questions uh, that you might have or um, uh, ideas or the sharing that you might have because I would love to know if you're already engaged in a formal type of process to achieve that truth and reconciliation um, type of thing or um, something similar to these kinds of activities and intentions. So Ganesh Chish Hawa for letting me have some time with all of you and for being patient as we uh, got everything up and running this morning. I really appreciate it. Ganesh Chish Hawa, Christine. Thank you, Miigwech, Liz. Um, yeah, so that was that was really fascinating and um, and beautiful to hear about the process that that First Alaskans has been undergoing and um, and you and I have been having conversations about this over the last couple of years and I've been watching this happen and um, just really really excited for for where this is going and as the boarding school healing coalition has also um, uh, not been as um, um, I don't want to say thoughtful, but really we weren't, we didn't have the capacity or the funding to do this type of um, large scale process. And, and so we just kind of um, ended up finding out through experience that, that this is, this is the model that is um, based in indigenous worldview and values is that it's, it starts with our communities. And we knew um, at the beginning of the, the formation of this coalition um, that things needed to be community led, especially the, the healing and the um, truth and the justice that it had to come from our communities. And um, with the number of um, different nations around the whole country that um, this is, is a quite, um, monumental and large scale process. And so we applaud what you're doing um, in Alaska and um, are really excited to hear about it. So we are going to go ahead and moderate some questions from our audience. And <clears throat> I'm looking at um, the questions that have been submitted so far. We have a couple. Oh, and great. yeah, and so, um, for those who, uh, if you have any questions and you haven't submitted those, go ahead and submit those now. Um, the first question here uh, was submitted midway, so um, you, you started to touch on this, but I'll just read it as it's written. 
Um, what are some of the ways that non-native organizations support this work, particularly when there is resistance to believing the truth when it's shared in forums, for, for instance, when non-natives are ignorant of history, but those people are in positions of power within the organization, uh, e.g. a non-native school or non-native nonprofit that provides services to native people? Mm. Yeah, that's, um, that's a really good question because it's really important. Um, and it is a really large part of the healing process. Um, so when we started, uh, gosh, we started over 10 years ago um, when the state of Alaska was quote unquote celebrating uh, 50 years of statehood, our organization, this is just when I joined First Alaskans Institute, I just, I came into it, they were just in the process of starting to have these dialogues that they had already kind of set up. Um, and they were, uh, our board and our staff were asking the question, is this a celebration for Native people? Um, are people celebrating this 50 years of statehood? Um, why don't we ask them? Uh, and so uh, I, I joined First Alaskans right at this point, and we traveled around the state, um, and we asked what are Alaska Native perspectives on statehood? So we didn't tell them how to feel about it. We didn't um, uh, we didn't say that you must celebrate. We're not celebrating. We're asking you what your perspective is. And across the state, we heard quite clearly um, some resounding themes. And um, they were that racism, discrimination, and bigotry were alive and well, and that we weren't talking about these things in Alaska. And our policy reflected that. Um, and our society reflected that. And our community was calling out for a change to that, to be addressed. And so um, we listened uh, around the state and we put together this, um, what we call Alaska Native Dialogues on Racial Equity. And through those racial equity dialogues, going into places where people were not friendly, non-Native people were not friendly to this idea for the most part, um, in Alaska, as in many places, but in Alaska, our experience was that uh, racism wasn't addressed. We didn't talk about it. And so at the heart of our work, our, our vision for our work was pretty simple. And that was um, that we're gonna have healing conversations about racism. And then we're gonna talk about policy and solutions to change that. Um, and that was really what it was. I mean, as simple as it gets, we're gonna have a conversation about racism. And you know what? A friend of mine said in one of our um, dialogue spaces, they're like, talking about racism isn't brain surgery. It's harder. No one on planet Earth is doing a really great job of this. This is one of the hardest things for us to talk about. And so we, as Native people, we co-created a process and principles and values and agreements, and we co-mingled that with um, various social technologies to create a different way for people to engage, a healing way for people to engage on these issues. Um, so that has, for us in our experience, that has been one of the kind of foundational steps um, to start getting us ready to be able to go into um, now where we're at, which is the TRHT uh, forum spaces. And, um, and, and we still conduct and still host these racial equity dialogues because it helps to um, really bring people along um, in their understanding and their, their knowledge. Um, they don't, they, it's really hard for people to get that anywhere else unless they're really seeking it. And um, and so those things kind of are side by side, they work together. Um, and we go into all kinds of different forums and all kinds of different sectors of people um, to have these conversations. And they're really hard and they're uncomfortable, but uh, we use what our, our elders taught us, right? As native people, this is something I've heard from so many from di diverse backgrounds. We only talk to you like this because we love you. Right? Like, we're going to talk about these hard things because we have to. And, um, and the other one is everyone's experience 
is there truth? So, and from a space of non-judgment over other people's experiences, just to be able to listen, it changes the way that you think about the world because you're like actually sitting side by side with somebody. And it's not about arguing over opinions. It's about listening to each other's story and, and caring for one another. And so that's how we've been approaching this. And we've had so much guidance from our community and from our brothers and sisters from other racial backgrounds um, and so much love and dedication to wanting to do it differently um, and to, to see a different result. And so those things go kind of hand in hand. So um, being in that kind of space where we're talking about racism directly and we're really you know, getting into those conversations that has bolstered and created a pathway by which we can really engage in what a TRHT can do. Um, and I think it's going to be significant in terms of the transformational aspect. Um, you know, we're at the front end of it, so I can't really, I can't really say, but I see it, you know, and I know Christine, you see it too. And that the work that you guys are doing is just, it's the right work. You know, it's the, it's, it's the thing that changes people's lives um, and is, is the thing that changes generations of lives. And so I just really wanna kind of lift you folks up and encourage you as best I can and, and help you folks as best I can. And I would love to know if there's other efforts around, um, you know, around the country. Uh, other people are involved in native people, other people of color. And I think that we can like link arms somehow and, and really, you know, continue to lift a movement on behalf of the people who say, we're done. That, that time of some people mattering more than others is, is over and we're in a new era, you know, and um, I can't wait for it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And yes, we um, we're glad for for our relationship and and um, and support you as well. And yes, absolutely. We are hoping to link arms with people. And so, if there is anyone who's listening in that is engaging in this type of work in your community, please um, use the the question field to send us a comment and and tell us about that. We would really like to hear about that, and maybe we can read some of those. Um, as we still have a f uh, 15 minutes left on the scheduled webinar time. So um, it would be nice to share some of that um, in this forum. Uh, another question is, um, oh, this one's for us. <laughs> um, is there going to be a next uh, conference next year and any clue as to where? So yes, um, we, we called it an annual conference, so we're kind of um, we're kind of stuck with that. <laughs> it has to be annual. Um, so yeah, the plan is to have a, another annual conference next year, and um, we don't know where. Although we've got some ideas, some some possibilities uh, and options that we're exploring, and um, it, I find it interesting that that question was asked on this webinar in particular because it makes me think. Um, that it would be really nice to, to head up to, to Alaska. And I'm sure that at some point we really do want to do that. So, yeah. Um, okay. Not, not official invite. <laughs> official invite. Awesome. Come Yay. To Alaska. Yes, yes. Um, I think it's important. Um, and 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 NABS's goal is to um, visit different regions as, as we hold the conference each year. And so... Um, Last year was the first conference and it was on the East Coast, um, up in the Northeast, and um, this year up in the Northwest. And so we'll, we'll continue to move it around um, to different regions of the country to, to make sure it's accessible for folks um, who can't travel that far for, for a national conference. Um, so another question is, is there a train the trainer resource for people that facilitate, host, or lead um, the racial equity dialogues or TRHT forums? Uh, yeah, and Christine, you probably know some other resources too, but the ones that pop to mind for me, um, we have on our website, we have our Andor agreements and a, a, a racial equity kind of toolkit, um, and that's firstalaskans.org. And then um, 
you can Google TRHT, Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation, um, and there's a slew of resources, just amazing resources out there. Uh, and one of the things that I really appreciate about all of these resources that are out there, there's also one, I think it's called the Racial Equity Toolbox. Um, that's another website. Uh, is that you can really find so many different ways of talking about these things that you can kind of fine tune what is the message that your community or the people you're engaging with need to hear. Um, and what we found, and I'll just share my own experience because other people have their own experiences and, and they're just as valid and real and important um, as you think about how you can do this. But what I've found um, is in thinking about how my grandparents work through tough conversations and just trying to model that. Um, I would see my grandparents sitting around the table and they would be talking about an issue or something happening in the community. Um, and they weren't, even if they had different ideas, if they had other elders sitting around talking about these things with one another, even if, if they had different ideas about how to address it or a difference of opinion, it wasn't adversarial. Uh, they really wanted to hear how other people thought about these things because it would make their decision making better because they could take all of this stuff into consideration. And, you know, um, they would hear other people's ideas and I, I would hear my grandpa, you know, um, you know, he wouldn't put someone's idea or their thoughts aside. He wouldn't brush them aside. He would, he would listen to them and he would, you know, he would say, huh, you know, like, you know, I hear what you're saying, you know, and, and, and here's, here's, here's my, my, my thoughts on it. Um, or I'll stand my idea up next to yours and, um, and allow all of those listening to really be much more informed. And so in the process, you know, we got to co-create this with amazing, brilliant, um, visionary folks um, around the state and they brought that energy and that spirit into the work and so it comes from a deep place of love and we talk about that you know it's not too often you go to meetings where you're talking about you know we love you even if the things that have happened and the and the and the opinions you might have are painful or hurtful or if they're racist or not true stereotypes, all those things. Like we're gonna love beyond the pain um, and we're gonna try to create a different type of relationship. It doesn't mean that we don't hold them accountable. In fact, it's actually the opposite because we are talking about a space of the truth and sharing those truths because everyone's got their own experience. And one of the things that we say, especially to non-native people, when we, you know, do a, ba uh, a, a kind of a, a base conversation or a base building conversation or a foundational conversation with folks, is we ask people to share their first experience with racism. And we acknowledge that not having an experience with racism is an experience. And um, we make room for all of those things because collectively, when we listen to each each other differently, it really does transform the conversation. Um, people might think it's touchy-feely, but it's in fact the only thing that actually changes policy. Because all the studies, all the research, all the data, it's all out there already. The statistics, it's all out there. And that's not changing people's minds about how they're gonna make policy or make decisions. The only way you can do that is to actually connect as human beings and, and, and really connect um, as people who listen to one another uh, from a completely different paradigm. Um, and, and that's really kind of the way that that work is centered, that racial equity dialogue work is centered. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love the way you said that. And I just keep thinking when you're talking about it, that, you know, that practice of deep listening. Um, and like you said, that really is transformative as people, um, if you engage in deep listening, um, you're not listening to respond, you're just listening to actually hear things from the other person's perspective. So th that is true, that is transformative. Um, so a couple more questions and then we can wrap things up. Um, is there, okay, I read that one, sorry. Um, yes, there is 
um, another question about the conference. Um, the, yeah, we will send out um, a follow-up to those who are registered today. Um, a, a way to make sure that you do get added to our email list is to go to our website, boardingschoolhealing.org, and sign up for the e-news on the website. Um, but we will manually add people who signed up for the webinar to that list as well. So. Um, Either way, you'll, you should be getting on the list. Um, and, and Liz, I have a question, because um, that's the end of our audience questions. Um, and it, it goes to the, you know, the conversations that we've been having over the, the last several months. For those who don't know, um, in um, spring this year, NABS convened a leadership summit, and we'll be um, communicating that in the coming weeks. Um, we um, came up with a 10-year strategic plan, and we invited um, partners from around the nation, and, and Liz, Liz was there, and um, we talked about this, this vision for, for moving the work of the Boarding School Healing Coalition forward um, past 2020. And one of the things that, um, that we talked about was, um, you know, things that Liz has mentioned on today's call about these, these models for truth and healing and transformation and um, and how we, we think about those as indigenous people being um, leading those. And that also it, it really is um, that, that we have some of these answers for, for a lot of the issues and, and um, problems that are facing all of humanity right now. So this is a global thing and racism is, is global as well. Um, and so these are human issues, not just indigenous issues. Um, so as we're looking at um, what NABS is uh, going to be doing over the next few years, we are going to reach out to our indigenous relatives in other countries that have experienced truth and what they called reconciliation, um, either commissions or some kind of model. And, and those were, and we're focusing on the ones that have been government based. Yeah. So, um, so that's kind of where my question for you is um, in hearing um, the TRHT model, which I think is an excellent and, and beautiful model and, and what you all have um, done in Alaska. But um, what are your thoughts about these TRC models and, mm -hmm. and the role of, that the government plays in, in that? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that um, happened at the front end of this whole effort, the national effort, was a lot of research about different kind of TRCs or truth and reconciliation movements around the the the, the world, and 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 trying to learn from what they did, right? To understand the processes that they used and to understand a little bit of the context that created that um, effort. And then the consequences or the follow uh, um, the follow on um, impacts afterwards. And you know, one of the things that for me, you know, I've, everyone probably took away different things, but for me, some of the stuff that I took away from that um, that research and those stories was that um, a lot of times these things happened around a political shift in a country, right? The most famous one I think that everyone talks about is um, South Africa and the ending of apartheid um and uh and then you, you know our, our our brothers and sisters and my my own family members who are um canadians on my Haida Gwaii side um going through the um the truth commissions in canada um and then there really hasn't been any real kind of notable um TRCs uh, across the United States, except for um, in Maine mm -hmm. um, and um, in uh, and there was one also I think a movement in Alabama mm -hmm. uh, and those uh, were a couple of the ones that we kind of looked at. Um, the one in Maine was about Indigenous people and it was about child welfare and it's really interesting that though we didn't talk about it this way after really kind of spending a little bit more time reading through their what they did there very similar to what happened here in Alaska in terms of our Alaska tribal children's welfare compact that was just signed into law um, uh, just over a year ago 
uh, two years ago, almost now. And, um, and so there was some similarities there. But a couple things really stood out. One is that most of them are really focused on policy change. Um, and the healing aspect uh, was not a um, was not a central pillar, right? So a lot of the policy stuff, a lot of research about those things, and a lot of like enactments of different ways to tr or recommendations for how to do it, um, but it wasn't linked to the the the, the social needs um, of the people themselves and um, that healing that we need to have in order to be able to come together and move forward together. So those were kind of things that weren't quite present or centered. They may have been there on the sides, um, but they weren't a, a core pillar of it. Um, and so we were trying to really learn from these and, um, and understand that people engaging in these processes were really committed to them and were really trying to do the best that they could, right? And so um, not trying to take away from what they did, but to try to like, you know, continue to grow and strengthen the process. Um, that's kind of the view. Um, like, what can we learn from these, these folks, you know, that put their heart and souls into this work? Um, what can we learn and what, how could we change that? Um, so that we are uh, atten we're attentive to that and that experience and, and the outcomes and think about that into how we develop this one. And so central to that is healing. That's, that's a component that's a little bit different um, in terms of being a, a real central pillar. And then the other is that um, we're not asking permission. We're not asking for governments to legitimize this we're not asking for governments to um, make it okay. Um, we're not asking for them to quote unquote, um, be the face so that people are talking at the government. Um, but we are inviting um, accountability partners. And those might be government representatives, they might be um, government agencies, but they can come alongside and they can um, be present um, we're also going to have um, the core folks who are there at these tribunals are the people who are going to kind of be the, the listeners, the receivers, um, the folks who can, that our communities will look to in terms of, I feel like I am talking to someone who cares about me, um, who, who, who can have a voice in ensuring that these that something comes of this um, rather than centering it on governments or agencies as the primary face of that we're going to center our people in that role and we're going to ask those agencies and governments and organizations and churches and all those folks that have these legacies to come alongside and be good relatives with us and really listen and then be able to kind of reflect back on that legacy that they have and be part of transforming what that looks like moving forward. Yeah, I like that term accountability partners. Um, so thank you so much, Liz. Um, if people want to stay updated on the progress of the TRHT work, how would they do that? Uh, they can contact us here at First Alaskans. Again, our website is firstalaskans.org, or they can call us. Our office um, number is 907-677-1700. Awesome. Great. Um, yeah, and we also host an annual Elders and Youth Conference. Mm -hmm. uh, so if folks are interested in coming up, um, if you need an invitation, consider this your invite. Um, come to our Elders and Youth Conference. We host it every year in October. Uh, we're always um, uh, excited to see who comes and who participates. So know that you're welcome to come to our Elders and Youth Conference too. I was there in 2017, and um, it's it's a beautiful gathering, and um, the the energy and and the gathering of both the elders and the youth and everyone from from the communities across the state is is just wonderful. And um, I'm, I was trying to remember the name of it. It's um, it's like a thank you night. Oh, it's Kuyana, right? 
Um, uh, Chinan at Elders and Youth is Chinan. Um, and then um, after we end our conference, our Elders and Youth Conference, the annual Alaska Federation of Natives Con Convention starts for their membership. Um, and they have Koyana Nights. Okay. Yeah, that's the one I went to. It was wonderful. Yeah, so amazing. It is. Yes. Anytime you get a bunch of drums gathered in one place, it's going to be powerful. So, yeah. Well, it, it's also something that I think is important for people to recognize. And I think our native people do, um, but I don't know that other people see it. And that is our people vote with their feet. Mm. You know, yeah. they are Chinan and Koyananites are the people show up. Um, that's where their heart is, you know, so it's really awesome to see sold out all the time. It's so amazing. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone uh, on the line is, has not been to um, Alaska, that would be the time to go is during the um, Elders and Youth Conference. So um, thank you, Liz, for, um, for sharing with us today about this wonderful heart work that you all are doing. And we look forward to, to partnering with you and staying updated um, with with the movement as we go forward. Oh, so for those, yeah, sorry about that. So for those listening, um, we will have a recording of this webinar, um, and we will post those on our website in in the new year. If you missed any of our previous webinars, you can listen to those recordings as well. So uh, we wish everyone a good holiday season, and uh, we will talk to you next year, next decade. Bye. Good to see you, Shawa.